Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome to our event. Uh, my name is Rich Batista. I am the founder and chairman of the Georgetown Entertainment and Media Alliance, otherwise known as JIMA, and a proud Hoya alum. We're uh, really thrilled to present this event to you. I'm particularly thrilled to do it in partnership with the Georgetown Institute of Politics and Public Service. You know, when we talked about putting this event on um, four or five weeks ago, we certainly thought it would be topical and timely. And boy, did I ever never realize how topical and timely it would be. So um, we have an incredible panel here of, of, of Georgetown affiliated folks that uh, you'll meet in a minute. Um, before we get started, I just want to say some quick thank yous. Uh, I want to thank um, Anne-Marie DiNardo and Mitch Pizer, who run GEMA DC and have been very involved in this event. I want to thank the folks at the GU Alumni Career Services who worked with us on this, Stephanie Seats and Justin Spence. And of course, I want to thank the, the fine folks at the uh, Institute of Politics, Mo Alethe, the founding executive director, and Carly Henry and Jeff Bible. So thanks to all of you. And um, I'm going to now turn it over to a really, uh, I think, interesting host today. Um, and uh, his name is Gabe Fleischer, and he is a freshman at Georgetown. And you may wonder why he's specifically hosting this event. Well, Gabe, when he was in, uh, I believe, third grade, um, created, and start, I want to get the name right, he created a an email newsletter, political briefing, a daily political briefing called Wake Up to Politics. And he's continued that um, email blog throughout that time and uh, has now 50,000 followers. And Gabe uh, started at Georgetown uh, in September. So we're thrilled to welcome him here. So I'm gonna turn it over to Gabe, who's gonna um, introduce our panel tonight. Gabe? Thank you. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining tonight's virtual forum event, jointly hosted by the Institute of Politics and Public Service at the McCourt School of Public Policy, known to many of you as GU Politics, and the Georgetown Entertainment and Media Alliance, and a special welcome to the alumni who are joining us today. As Rich said, my name is Gabe Fleischer, and I'm a freshman in the college studying government, and then I also cover the 2020 campaign a bit myself as the author of Wake Up to Politics, so I'm really looking forward to hearing from our panelists. So I'm pleased to introduce them tonight. We have three Georgetown alumni and also one current GU politics fellow. Sam Feist, a member of the Georgetown Law class of 1999, is senior vice president and Washington bureau chief at CNN. Aaron Haynes, a fall 2020 GU politics fellow, is editor at large for the 19th and, and an MSNBC contributor. Julia Jester is a member of the Georgetown class of 2015 and is a political reporter with NBC News and Ken Thomas, a member of the class of 1997, is a national political reporter with the Wall Street Journal. So please join the conversation on social media using the hashtag GU Virtual Forum and by tagging at GU Politics and the Georgetown Entertainment and Media Alliance at GMA Hoyas. Tonight's event will be moderated by GU Politics' executive director, another Georgetown alum, Mo Alethe, who's gonna kick us off. Gabe, okay, thanks so much. First, uh, Rich, thank you uh, for your partnership. Uh, with GEMA. We're, we were excited when you when you uh, came to us with the idea to do this event together and um, very much appreciate the partnership. And Gabe, um, what can I say? Hoya Saxa, we couldn't be more thrilled to have you at Georgetown. Um, I've known of Gabe Fleischer for years, actually, back from before I started this job when I was uh, a communications director working in politics. Um, I, I've watched, I've seen him interview presidential candidates. I have seen uh, other journalists uh, pick up his work and use it in their own. Um, frankly, we always love having a student uh, introduce our panel. Uh, this is a student who uh, should be on this panel. So we're looking forward uh, to your continued participation in the process, Gabe, throughout your, your Georgetown career and excited to see what you do. Um, man, this year, right? I mean, this is a year unlike any other in politics and unlike any other in covering politics. And so we're thrilled to bring four people who are uh, on the front lines of helping the rest of us try to make sense of this nuttiness um, on, a, on a daily basis. The conversation, we're going to start uh, with the panel uh, amongst ourselves for a little bit. Uh, and then bring you in for your questions about halfway through the program. Uh, 
To submit your question, please, you can start populating it now at the bottom of your screen. You'll see the Q&A tab for those of you that are uh, viewing here in Zoom. Um, just click on that. Uh, please make sure to tell us your school and uh, year and your Georgetown affiliation. Uh, and uh, then at some point, someone from our team will let you know when your question's been selected. We will then bring you up on screen to ask your question. So uh, as Sam Feist and over at CNN would say, uh, you know, make sure you're camera ready uh, because we're gonna, we're gonna make you famous. Um, and so with that, you know, I wanna start the conversation. Um, there's been so much happening this year. You know, I mean, impeachment happened this year. Remember that? Like that feels like a decade ago at this point. But impeachment, COVID, um, the the protests that were sparked by uh, racial injustice, the unrest in our urban areas, the death of a Supreme Court justice, the president of the United States getting COVID, right? And, and like, Lord knows I'm missing like 15 other really important things. I want to start um, maybe with Julia and Ken as two journalists who are on the actual campaign beat, right? The, the following sort of the day-to-day -day of what's happening. Um, this has to feel and be playing out differently than you expected it to when you signed up for this beat. Talk to us a little bit about the challenges of covering the campaign. Let's start with the campaign. What are the challenges of covering the campaign? How is it different maybe than, than you've done it in the past? Julia, why don't you kick us off? Yeah, so I am a political campaign embed. So basically signed up for a year and a half of schlepping gear around the country, being in tight, cramped gaggles with candidates, shouting questions, being able to have, you know, that frontline view of not only what's going on with the campaign, but also voters. Um, and I think both parts are equally as important, covering the events and asking candidates critical questions, whether it's breaking news or something deeper. And then also, you know, when the candidate's not on stage, talking to voters across the country. I was based in New Hampshire for nine months, and I'm so grateful that I was because when COVID hit and now we're not not really getting to talk to voters out in the wild as much, if you will. I have numbers of voters in New Hampshire and across different battleground states I was able to travel to where I can, you know, text them their thoughts and their opinions of undecided voters. And, you know, that's something that is not the same as being in person, but it's it's how I've, you know, been able to adapt to not really being able to be out and about. Um, I covered mostly the Democratic primary, so I haven't really been out on the trail with, say, Pennsylvania or Trump, but I know that my colleagues have really had to adapt there too, especially with all of the safety measures and the precautions. So not only, you know, I mean, I think we're always aware of our safety when we're out reporting, but in this election now, we have to be aware of our health too, uh, which is something that normally wouldn't have happened pre-COVID. Um, but I think that, you know, the, the challenge obviously is not having that face-to-face -face coverage as much. Um, we definitely do still have reporters out. I've been out and about a bit, um, but I think that something that uh, one of my my bosses and mentors said, you know, I'm impressed at how everyone's been pivoting from politics to all these different stories, but then realized it's all political. You know, COVID and how people are getting their health care, that's inherently political. These protests going out and covering those, that affects the election. So everything has turned into campaign coverage, even if it's not the traditional campaign trail that we're used to. Ken, you're, I mean, you've been a veteran of, of many of these campaigns. You and I first met covering a, you know, when you were covering a governor's race down in Florida that I was working on more years ago than, than either of us would like to admit. Um, I mean, why don't you pick up where Julia left off and talk a little bit more about sort of the differences between what you've done, in the, how you've covered them in the past and how you're covering it now. Yeah, it's, it's really forced us to be creative. Um, you know, I, I'm someone, you know, I've covered a lot of campaigns. I'm at, I'm at the journal. I spent about uh, close to 20 years at the AP before that. And so I've always just gotten a lot from being in the room. Uh, you know, when you're in a campaign setting, 
you will run into sources in the hotel lobby. You know, you will, uh, you know, see advisors on the sidelines of these events. And when the candidate is speaking, I often will look at the faces of the advisors to see whether they seem to be happy with what they're hearing or if they're grimacing. Um, you know, all of that goes out the window and we've really been forced to, you know, use other tools at our disposal. You know, we're constantly texting our sources, you know, we're constantly trying to get them on the phone. And, you know, like, like Julia said, we're, we're, we're digging through those, those notebooks and finding old phone numbers for voters we, we interviewed a few months ago. Um, you know, I, I just think back on this year and it, it's, it's just remarkable how things just almost switched off like a light bulb. Um, you know, I, I spent a lot of time with Biden uh, last year and then, you know, in the early states. And, you know, we saw this transformation of, of a candidate who was, you know, very close to being out of the race after, after New Hampshire. And we saw him pick up ground in Nevada and then, and then really just everything changed in South Carolina. And I just remember being with him, you know, in that stretch from Nevada into South Carolina and then into Super Tuesday. And I had a very long time on the road and, you know, he did very well on Super Tuesday and we were out in California. And I remember flying home thinking, well, I'll be back in a week or so. And, you know, I never went back. Uh, you know, the, 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 that, that stage of the campaign ended for me. And, and, you know, since then, it's just been a lot of trips to Delaware. I, you know, I went with him to Wisconsin a few weeks ago, but I, I think it's just, um, it, it's, it's almost like covering a hurricane in a way, you know, I, I spent a lot of time in Florida and, you know, we would occasionally have these moments where there'd be a big storm that would come through and you're just finding, trying to find ways to talk to people and, and to cover the story and, and help those sources be your eyes and ears almost. And so, um, you know, it's just unlike any other campaign I've covered in, and I think it's really stretched all of our, our abilities and skills. Sam, um, first of all, one of the biggest losses for me of, of this new model of, of journalism in this campaign is the loss of the CNN grill. So, you know, if there's any way we can sort of um, uh, make sure that I can get back in there uh, as soon as it reopens, please let me know. Um, look, you're responsible for overseeing as much of, you know, all, all of the political stuff, right? Everything that, that normally comes out of DC, um, the campaign. Um, and picking up on the point that Julia made earlier, that all of this other stuff clearly intersects with politics, right? The rhythm is way off from your traditional uh, your traditional election year. How do you, as someone who is in charge of helping to drive the network's coverage, how how do you navigate all this? Uh, it's a good question. I mean, this is you know, there's not a person on watching um, this uh, this this panel that hasn't had um, their lives turned upside down. So we've all had to reinvent our. Uh, ways of doing things, our workflow. Um, you know, there there are 500 people who work at the CNN Washington bureau, um, and so that gives us resources to walk and chew gum at the same time. Because um, it has been really important for us to not interrupt our anything from our political coverage as we have done deep dives into COVID, in deep dives into the racial reckoning. Had teams to cover. Um, uh, voting, the Justice Department, a lot of big stories there, Ginsburg, et cetera. Um, and so that's been very important for us to, to really keep the political team doing what they do. Um, uh, our folks who do what Julia does have not, uh, they haven't stopped and they haven't been sidetracked, if you will, by, uh, by these other unbelievably important and big stories that intersect with the campaign, but don't uh, necessarily overlap every day. Uh, um, with every angle, but it's been, it's, you know, it's been a challenge. So put aside COVID uh, in, in terms of the impact on how we do our jobs and just think of it as the biggest story, uh, the biggest continuous story that any of us maybe ever covered. And it just takes a massive number of people. It, this is a data story. This is a politics story. This is a medical story. This is a society story. This is an economic story. So every muscle 
that any of us have ever used in journalism, um, we have had to deploy to cover this story. And that uh, also takes really massive, massive resources. And then you layer in how much more difficult it is to do our jobs. We don't have um, newsrooms in the traditional sense um, operating where people can collaborate, they can look at a story, they can look over each other's shoulders, an editor can have a quick conversation with a reporter. So everything takes longer than it normally would because of the, the distance. Um, so it's, it's you know, issue on top of issue, and yet it has been, I, I, I think the American journalism has covered 2020 in a remarkable way, and it has shown how important journalism is, how important journalists are, and the adaptability of all of these news organizations of my three colleagues who are here. Um, uh, it's just been remarkable. I mean, the, the stories, we can't quite believe that we're doing what we're doing every day because, uh, in this environment, and yet we are. Um, and we're covering the biggest stories of our lifetime. And, and I dare say, um, these stories are being covered incredibly well. And, um, and the American public is being very well served by, uh, uh, by the journalism corps right now. Uh, just a reminder to the audience, you can begin populating your questions at any time at the Q&A tab at the bottom. So feel free to just start typing those in uh, whenever you'd like. You know, Aaron, one of the things that um, I always appreciate about journalists recovering politics and all the stories that intersect with it is um, I, I always think the best journalism is the journalism that helps me understand not the back and forth between the politicians, but the impact on people and the ones who actually paint a picture for me of how real people are, are, are internalizing what's happening, how they're engaging with it, how they're feeling about things. It's hard to do that this year because of COVID. But I wanna focus on, on one of the many stories this year and that was the, the protests over the summer where there were a lot of people out there to engage with. And I'm wondering, and I know you were on the front line covering that story. I'm wondering if maybe you can talk a little bit about that and some of the challenges and opportunities and, and how you provide that important context to people when so many other places, they're just getting the back and forth here in Washington. Yeah, uh, so um, as was mentioned, I am currently editor at large at the 19th, which is a nonpartisan nonprofit newsroom focused on the intersection of gender, politics, and policy. But before that, uh, I was a national writer on race in America for the Associated Press. Uh, Kim was my old colleague, so it's good to share a screen with Ken again. And gosh, I remember the last time we were uh, together was in South Carolina, uh, headed into Super Tuesday. Um, and that was the last time we were, we were really on the campaign trail. And, you know, um, when I came to the 19th, I, I really didn't expect to still be covering uh, issues of race as much as I have been this year. I thought that I was going to have kind of more of an opportunity to focus primarily on what it means to be a woman uh, in, in this democracy, women being the majority of the electorate, right? But um, then Breonna Taylor happened. And, you know, I, I, was, I was back in it and, you know, thankfully had had Kind of that foundation of having covered uh, this, this emerging modern protest movement uh, and bringing that to bear uh, for our audience at, at the 19th to show them why uh, this was an issue that should matter to them because we know that, that black women don't get the attention often that they uh, that, 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 that black men get uh, when they are killed uh, by, by law enforcement and so that became uh, you know yet another story but but you know as a political reporter it's interesting yes for most of us this was supposed to be the super bowl this year you know this was already going to be the most consequential election i think that most of us ever uh, had covered uh, and 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 i certainly thought that going into 2020 that race and gender just were not going to be a storyline of this election cycle but we're going to be the storyline and that was even before the dual pandemics of coronavirus and racism but that has been proven to be absolutely true i mean just to echo julia's point uh, we really are at the intersection of everything. The pandemic is political. Racism is on the ballot for these voters. And so really hearing from them uh, in this moment, uh, yeah, everybody knows at this point who, you know, Joe Biden, who's been in, in, in politics for half a century, Donald Trump, who's certainly been in public life and been a celebrity for a long time. People know who the two of them are. This is really an election about who the voters are. And so having as much of a handle on who they are could not be more important in this moment. And yet it is so challenging because of the pandemic, because we need to talk to voters and yet everybody 
you know, has been inside, has been on lockdown and, and, and it's not, it's easy to kind of, you know, walk up and do man on the street interviews when you have on a mask, they have on a mask and, and you're approaching a stranger in the middle of a, of a global health, uh, public health crisis. But, uh, but, but, but we are finding ways uh, to do that, to make that happen because it is so crucially important. Uh, we know perennially, you know, the top issues for voters are healthcare, the economy, education. The COVID-19 crisis encapsulates all of those things. And so those are the things that are on the minds of voters who are casting ballots, even as we speak. And like I said, I think going into, uh, you know, the last, what are we, 26 days out, I mean, the gender gap is a story, which is why it's ideal. We could not have envisioned starting a newsroom in the middle of a pandemic, but it has absolutely worked out for us because uh, women are not only the majority of the electorate, they're the majority of the U.S. workforce, the U.S. population, and the people that are being disproportionately impacted by and responding to pan- the pandemic. So, yes, uh, you know, as a political journalist, I was I was able to pivot to the pandemic as political and really talk about how the intersection of everything is on people's minds as they head to the ballot box. I want to talk about one of the one of the several eight hundred pound gorillas in the room. Um, look, we're in the Institute of Politics and Public Service, right? And I truly one of the reasons we always have a fellow uh, who comes from the world of journalism in each of our fellows' classes, as Aaron is right now, because we believe that journalism is a form of public service. And so, I thank you all, right, for for helping us make sense of what's happening out there. But having said that right? Trust in journalism, trust in the media is at a pretty low, low. Um, You know, as much as we talk about how little people trust the president, for example, at least according to the polling, the media is right down there with him in terms of how much people trust it. And so I'm wondering if each of you could maybe talk a little bit about why you think that is and how that's impacting what you do um, uh, on a day-to-day basis, whether you are out on the trail facing voters at, at rallies or um, just how, you, how that impacts you, how you communicate your stories. Um, Sam, why don't we start with you on this one, right? I mean, you guys, it, it often feels like you are a major target of those who want to sow distrust in the media. Talk about why you think that is. Oh, listen, the president has not made um, uh, a secret of his intent to, to challenge and run against the media. He's been doing this since, since the 2016 campaign. The, you know, we are the enemy of the American people um, because I think he, he feels that it is a, uh, it, it's a good strategy can't get inside his head beyond that, but he thinks that that's a good strategy. Um, and of course, uh, I don't believe that any of us, and I'll speak on behalf of my organization, uh, we're not anti-Trump in any way. We are pro-truth. Um, it doesn't matter who we are covering. Um, if you say something that's not true, um, that is for any journalist an opportunity because this is our job. Our job is to hold those in power accountable and Keep those in, count, uh, in power um, speaking the truth. This is this is you know there's there's almost nothing that that gets every journalist going almost excited than a public official or a leader saying something that's not true when we know and we have the facts to back ourselves up. So we're not anti-Trump. We are pro-truth. It's a it's a, sort of a, uh, a easy position for us. But his uh, you know the president's rhetoric and his uh, attacks on the media uh, they definitely have an impact. Um, with his supporters, um, I, I, you know, I am sure that 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 uh, Julia, as she goes out there uh, to, if she goes to a Trump rally or her colleagues, all of our colleagues, um, they have to worry about their safety. I mean, this is something that, you know, I've been covering uh, politics. I was a, 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 a an embed in the mid '90s. I, the one thing I never worried about was my personal safety going to a political event, Democrat or Republican. And yet now, news organizations, television networks, actually have to um, consider and think about security, physical security for their reporters. Um, that was unheard of. And so uh, the, the rhetoric actually does turn into uh, uh, getting his supporters charged up sometimes. And it does lead to um, concerns about our safety. And that's, um, that's you know, um, 
I, I think that's just absolutely un-American, but it is what it is and we, we deal with it. Um, I don't know whether, um, I don't know how much the um, trust in media issues are related to the president, but I think that they're, um, uh, I think they're significant, certainly among, uh, among the president's supporters. Uh, but I hope that um, people will, viewers, readers, of all television networks, of all political persuasions, will um, look back on this era and think, okay, well, who was telling the truth? Where, where was the accurate information? Was it from partisan blogs, uh, partisan Twitter accounts, public officials, or was it from the news media who has made it our mission to seek truth and to hold people accountable? And I, I hope when we all look back on this era It'll be the latter, because um, that's what we all, of course, that's why we all got into journalism. That's what we do. And um, and and I, you know, perhaps I'm, I'm just optimistic or too optimistic, but I I think the public will, uh, will eventually figure that out. Um, Julia, um, how is it when you're out there on the trail um, and, and how is the trust issue impacting the way you are able to cover the race? So, I mean, as Sam mentioned, it's it's been no secret that that there have been comments that the media is the enemy of the people. First of all, I do not like the phrase the media, like when people are being critical, like reporters were not perfect for human beings, but everyone tries so hard committed to truth. And that's what matters at the end of the day. And the rest is just noise. So even if, you know, my colleagues and I are at, say, a Trump rally or another environment that's not the most media friendly, you know, that is all the those kind of cries are all noise. Our commitment is to the truth and to the voters. And so what I do is I try to stick to the facts, be a human being. And there have been times, you know, we were talking about man on the street interviews where I'm trying to just chat with folks about their reaction to, you know, whether it is the Supreme Court or Trump contracting COVID. They're so skeptical at first. Um, and I'll, I'll talk to, to folks who identify across the spectrum and they might be hesitant to trust the media or to talk to me. But if I show that I'm competent, that I know the truth and the facts and I'm a human being, they warm up. And then if that one on one personable interaction can change how they view the media, then that's a win for me. You know, I'm not there to kind of fact check their feelings or, you know, it, it's it's something that I've really noticed the divide between real life and the internet and being virtual <laughs> in a lot of ways during this campaign has made that really tricky. Um, and it just kind of reminded me how important it is to be in person there on the front lines and just say what you see um, because that's, you know, in, indisputable when it, when we're talking about trust in media, you know, we don't necessarily have to provide commentary on what the viewers are seeing, they can discern that for themselves. Um, so I think that just kind of keeping your head focused and keeping that mission of truth is so important because there were a lot of lessons learned after 2016. Um, but I think that I hope that given all of the incredible investigative journalism that's been happening, um, that, that folks will really start to appreciate the work that we do um, and that we can also earn that trust by continuing to, to listen to folks. And as Aaron was saying, it's so important to, to meet voters where they are and really hear from them. So I think it's a little bit of a relationship that that's, has to build. Uh, Aaron, let me turn to you because, you know, Sam asked the question, right? Like, you know, how much of this is driven by the president's um, fanning of the flames? Uh, we may never know. But we do know, at least according to public polling, that erosion in uh, of trust in journalism did was happening before Donald Trump became president. Right. And so, you know, the media landscape has changed so much over the past several decades. It is so much more um, uh, diverse of a landscape, so to speak. I'm just wondering what your thoughts are on like, why has, I mean, why has there been this, this slow and steady erosion and what can you all do about that? Uh, you know, Mo, it's interesting. I think that, um, you know, 
when we're talking about when we're talking about the concept of fake news and kind of the rise of the concept of fake news, I think that what we're actually talking about is is, is uh, fake news specifically being about national political journalism, right? Like, like they're not people that are just like, oh my God, that late, that, there's no way that that cat was really up in that tree. Nobody's angry about that. They are angry about the, the coverage of, of our national politics and how and how they perceive uh, us as a press corps covering that. And, and uh, you know, while I certainly would not call it fake news, I certainly think that there is, is some validity of the criticism of the way that we have covered, uh, you know, our, our politics in American journalism. And, and yes, while we do have newsrooms that are more diverse, I certainly have more company on the campaign trail in terms of women, in terms of people of color uh, than I did maybe say in 2016 or even 2012 or 2008. But the reality is that the gatekeepers, the decision makers, and frankly, most of the people who are on the campaign trail are still white, male, or both. And that means that you still are gonna get the same narratives despite the fact that you have more women running for office and more people of color running for office. You saw that in the Democratic primary and you also have seen that down ticket, right? So if those narratives are not changing, you start to kind of understand how some of that skepticism can can persist. Uh, although I certainly do not subscribe to the fake news narrative, and will you know try to disabuse anyone that is that is willing to have those good faith conversations about why um, you know that that is not a, a real argument. But I will tell you, uh, being a race reporter actually prepared me to cover politics because uh, to cover race is to constantly be told that you are covering fake news right? Systemic racism, not real. I cannot believe that in 2020, you have a majority of Americans that are actually open to just the concept that Black Lives Matter. That was not something that was true in 2014 when that first emerged, right? So like the idea that the legacy of slavery is a real thing. You know, why are you writing that? Why can't you just move on? Why are you race baiting, right? When I'm really just trying to take the emotion out of it and give people facts and information. So, you know, I think above all, at the end of the day, my job is to leave behind the most honest and accurate record of who and where we are as a country. Uh, and that, I think, is the way to, to combat the fake news argument. If, if I am doing that, uh, then I am doing my job regardless of, of how people feel about, about the state of, of American journalism. But I do think that uh, diversity in the media goes a long way to addressing this issue as well, because if people are seeing uh, us in their communities, telling the stories of, of their community as a whole and not just in times of crisis. Uh, you know, I think that goes a long way to fostering a relationship with, with the public. Uh, if, if they are seeing that, uh, you know, their, the newsrooms in their community are reflective uh, of, of those communities in terms of representation, I think that that is, is, is also helpful. And so, yeah, I, 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 these are issues that are not limited to any any one newsroom. And frankly, part of the reason that I helped to start a new newsroom is because I felt like it would be faster to try to build that culture uh, instead of to continue to try to fix it. I, I do think that, that, that this is something that all newsrooms should be working on. And I know that in the national reckoning uh, around race, uh, you know, among the institutions that are that are wrestling with this are American newsrooms. And I think rightly so, because the 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 um, suggestions of the Kerner Commission in 1968 are still right there for whoever wants to pick them up and, and run with them. I'd be curious your thoughts. I mean, you know, you came, you spent 20 years at the AP, right? Which is just like, you know, one of the most well-established news organizations in history. You, and as long as I've known you, you've been like very much just a straight down the line. Here's, you know, here are the facts kind of reporter. What's it like to be that kind of a reporter in the age of Twitter, right? How is social media impacting the job and how does that intersect with, uh, with this trust question? Yeah, that's a really interesting point. It, it, I mean, it gives you a bigger audience than you had uh, certainly 10 years ago, but it can also amplify uh, things that maybe don't build trust in, in, in journalism. I feel like um, transparency is really important to this conversation and the issue of trust. I think the the best stories often tell the readers this is this is how we went about doing our job and and, and almost demystifying the the journalism process, the act of journalism. Um, and and sometimes that gets lost, I think, in in social media because you know you only have 130. Uh, characters and on Twitter, um, but but I think um, I think the the all of this has taught us that 
maybe you need to slow down in, in when you're doing your job. Maybe you need to not be too gratuitous on Twitter, not, you know, get into, you know, I, I think there's a tendency or a temptation to really personalize things and to, to, you know, express your views maybe more than you would. Um, and so I don't know. I, I think that sometimes we need to, you know, think before we tweet and, and, and be careful what we say, because we certainly are, I think, under a bigger, um, you, you know, we're just, there's just much more scrutiny in everything that we do and everything that we write. And I think it, it behooves us in this environment to just try to be maybe more circumspect on, on what we write and what we say on social media. Ken is so right on that, Mo. If I can just uh, piggyback on that, because I spent more than a decade in my career at the AP2, and so like my grounding and foundation in journalism is 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 that as well. I mean, that was the place that that really raised me journalistically, and and I think that 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 does inform a lot of my behavior on Twitter. I mean, I'm on Twitter. I'm very active on Twitter, but also just kind of always keeping in the back of my mind a couple of things. Twitter is not America, okay? The majority of Americans are not on Twitter, right? The majority of, of the folks that, that seem to be popping up in my timeline are, are, are journalists. So, so there's also that, right? Uh, but but, but, but um, it, the idea of like showing our work, uh, as, as Ken was saying, being transparent with people about how we got certain stories or, or um, you know, why we are telling certain stories. I, I think that that is helpful for building relationships. Uh, Twitter is, for me at least, is, is what uh, you make of it uh, sometimes. It is how you are using it. Uh, you know, I do not engage in fighting with people on Twitter. Uh, I don't, like, I, when I'm watching things like uh, debates, uh, I don't live tweet those. You don't need to know what I think about, you know, what, what, what is happening in real time. That's what my analysis piece is for on the other end of the debate, right? So um, I, I think that part of it probably is generational. I mean, certainly I'm comfortable on social media, but I'm not like a digital native, like say my niece who's in college who, you know, just is sharing everything on social media. I look at that sometimes and I'm just kind of, you know, cringing, but, but that's not, you know, that's not how I came up. Um, and, 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 and I do think that that informs kind of how I operate as, as a journalist on the platform. But, but I do think um, journalists have to think about what they are using the platform for and really thinking about it as an extension of, uh, for me, is it, it, it is mostly an extension of the work. Although, I mean, if anybody on here is following me, you know, I'm also tweeting about Peppa Pig on the, you know, occasional, uh, you know, Saturday night. But, uh, but yeah, I, I think that, that uh, thinking about it as an extension of, of, of the work maybe can help to, to um, counterbalance the need sometimes to, um, to go tend towards tend tend towards uh, opinion more, and just to add one more thing, I think in a world of of ratings and clicks, and you know that is the name of the game, and in some ways, I think it goes back to why should readers care? Why do people care? And I think as a reporter, if you can get back to that, then that is how you can get the really important work to break through and for people to trust it. You know, I was tasked with getting. MOS in, in Detroit reaction to Trump taxes when that, that big story broke by the New York Times. And I expected, I, I don't even know what I expected, but I had some people saying, you know, it's not really going to make a difference. But then I was chatting with other folks in different areas of Michigan who said, no, I'm actually upset by this because it, it made me think of how much I pay in taxes. And so this is a story that I can actually feel like I relate to as a taxpayer. And so connecting it, always connecting reporting and, and the work as to why are you doing the work? Why is, does this story matter? How are readers gonna connect to it? I think is is really critical component of it as well. And the most important thing Aaron said, Aaron said a lot of important things, but the most important thing was Twitter is not America. And journalists should never, nobody should be confused that Twitter is America, but journalists sometimes get caught up in it and sometimes think, oh, it's blowing up on Twitter. That must be that everyone in America cares. And no, that's not necessarily true. And it's just really important for us to, to, um, to keep that self-awareness
about Twitter, social media in general, about what is likely resonating across the country and what's not. And yeah, it's funny. I've, I've always said that, like, I think one of the biggest flags uh, for journalists is to make sure Twitter doesn't become your assignment editor, right? Just because something suddenly is popping on Twitter doesn't like take a second before you, you jump on it, right? Um, and I think uh, politicos make the same mistake too, how campaigns react as well as journalists. I'm sorry, Ken, you're going to say something. I was going to say one thing we heard from the Biden campaign for months is that Twitter is not the Democratic Party as they're uh, trying to carve out uh, the, you know, their, their spot in the race. And so uh, I think you know, the fact that Biden was able to emerge uh, you know, after a pretty tough primary uh, you know, says something about you know, the, the role of social media and, and how representative it is. Because if you only looked at Twitter, you would never, ever, ever think that Biden could have won the Democratic primary um, uh, over the, the, the winter of 2019 and 2020. Never. Um, but that's exactly right, Ken. And the Biden campaign pointed it out. But I think also smart observers and journalists and people who were talking to voters in Iowa, where Ken spent a lot of time, and in New Hampshire, where Julie spent a lot of time, um, you would realize that that's exactly right. That and, the, the polls, South, the polls of the Carolina. parties do a lot of time with it. In South Carolina. I mean, the black vote was consistent, <laughs> you know, from the time that Joe Biden got into the race to the time we got to super, by the time we got to South Carolina, it was consistent. So, you know, while people were declaring Joe Biden DOA, I was like, well, I mean, his black support's not slipping. And guess who the base of the party is like? This is, a, this is the nominee. Right. And but by the way, those 50 or 60 year old um, uh, black voters in South Carolina, they aren't on Twitter. No, they're, they're not. They're not being represented not. in that conversation. And had no idea who Pete Buttigieg was. Had so no this idea. is just another reason the journalists actually have to go there, get on talk the ground, to people. Yeah. talk to people, find them. And um, uh, that's really the only way to. That's really the only way to practice political journalism at the end of the day, and that's one of the things that COVID has made uh, very difficult for a few months. Although we're all getting getting, um, we, we we sort of all returned to the trail in one way or another um, yeah. as the summer wore on. Um, I've got a bunch more questions, but I want to get to the audience questions, which are normally better than mine. Um, so when I call on you, you're going to pop up on screen. Tell us uh, who you are your Georgetown affiliation, where you're Zooming in from, and then ask your question. So the first uh, person I'm gonna call, oh, Roy, good to see you again. It's been some time. Hi, good to see you guys. Um, just to introduce, uh, my name's Roy Hadar. I am an SFS alum, class of 2017. Um, I was part of the, uh, actually, I believe the first year of GU politics back when it started five years ago. Um, I'm here in Arlington, Virginia. Um, I'm actually working at, uh, at Washington Week on PBS. Um, and I just had a question that I had thought of um, in terms of reading a lot of sort of discourse on campaign coverage from 2016 and 2020. Um, it feels like in a lot of other branches of journalism that reporters will take often strong stands in their reporting or in their public statements. Um, but it feels like in political journalism, it's more common for kind of a both sides approach sometimes that Democrats say X and Republicans say Y and, you know, kind of leaving it at that. Um, and I know in 2016, there was a lot of criticism about it potentially drawing a false equivalence. Um, and I know many outlets have been a lot better about that from 2016 to 2020, but it still seems relatively common. And my question is, why do you think it is that that is such a common temptation in political reporting? Julia, you wanna take that one first? Yeah, I think sometimes, for me, I think sometimes it starts with when people in power are saying one thing and whether or not it is true, you inherently, feel compelled to report on it because it's people who are in power, whether it's a senator or the president or someone with that platform. Now, if it, it's someone who's running against them, they're also in that 
public position. But I think it's, you know, th- there's this responsibility to report on what the president is saying and doing, for example, or what this person in power is saying and doing. But it is, you're right, it is important to note, um, you know, what the all opposing view is saying, but also kind of fill in the middle ground of, well, where are the facts and what is true? And it doesn't necessarily always have to be this side is right and this side is wrong. And I think there's this temptation to to kind of do that. Um, but I think, you know, it, it is a big, big issue in, in reporting of trying not to, to fall into the trap of, fa- of false equivalence. Um, but I think, again, going back to truth and facts and letting those really carry the weight as opposed to trying to get like that 50 50 divide because that's not necessarily always the case um so i mean i don't know if there's a simple solution for that but i think again it go it goes back to really knowing the facts and and knowing why why pe- what the intention is of people saying and doing certain things because then you can kind of approach it of like you know what are the intentions behind it as well I don't know if that fully answers the question, but I think that that is definitely a big, a big part of that. Um, And I think in in some areas we've seen that there are places where it doesn't necessarily have to be like, I don't know, I think, for example, with um, like Black Lives Matter, with that conversation, the protests, it's like, okay, you know, systemic racism is real. It is a thing. Having that baseline, then you can go from there versus arguing, well, this person says that racism isn't real. And this person says that it is real because that's not productive. Um, you kind of got to move, move past that. Um, so yeah, I hope that sort of answered the question. Yeah. And also, uh, or just to use that same example, Julia, to say, you know, that when we know that the overwhelming majority of protests were peaceful, like equating peaceful right. protests with with rioting and looting and saying that they were happening to the same degree, like that's not real. You know, you don't have to do it. I, I'm also a huge sports fan. Uh, and I think, you know, political journalism, a lot of times, I mean, it's, it's like covering a game. You can have both. You, you can cover both teams and still tell the truth about what happened. Right. Like if 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 uh, somebody got their ass kicked, like you can say that that's what happened, uh, you know, it, while still having both both sides perspective uh, in the story. And and to Julia's point, it, it really is just about, uh, tell, you can tell the truth while in, including everyone. It, it, it doesn't have to be a, uh, you know, something that, that kind of puts uh, folks on equal footing when that is not, uh, in fact, what happened, and you know, it is our job. Again, this is about this is about accuracy. It is it is not um, about you know objectivity, which is something that we are wrestling with as an industry uh, a lot right now, uh, as you know. All right, Roy, good to see you again. Thanks for the question. Um, I want to try to get in as many more of these as we can. Uh, let's bring back Gabe. Hey. Um- me again. I, I wanted to ask about the, the presidential debates. Obviously, we, we've had two so far, and they're both kind of in different ways, but neither of them really, there were many kind of direct answers to a lot of the policy questions that were asked. I'm wondering if any of you have any thoughts about how you would potentially restructure the debates or change the formats, trying to ensure that the candidates are following rules, and then also kind of like actually answering the questions that are asked. I would just say I'm really looking forward to the town hall setup because I think it's a very effective setup. Uh, people tend to behave better in front of voters. <laughs> uh, candidates tend to do that, and so um, so I think I think I, I mean I hope that that if uh, there are going to be more presidential debates, that that, that at least one of those is is a town hall. And Sam, you guys have you have a lot of experience running debates, right? Uh, yeah. So you know, traditionally, individual networks will run the primary debates, and so we did a. Uh, quite a number of them this year. And then um, the Commission on Presidential Debates runs the the general election debates. And, you know, to the commission's credit for the last three decades, we have had three presidential debates almost every cycle and one vice presidential debate. And that in and of itself is an accomplishment because in every cycle, there is um, uh, usually one candidate that doesn't want to debate and one candidate that does. And sometimes that changes in the middle of the cycle. But usually the person who's in the lead has an interest in not debating because they want to continue on without taking chances. And a debate watched by 80 million people um, is potentially a, a risk. So to the commission's credit, they have figured out, um, uh, they've made it 
very difficult for candidates not to participate in the debates. This year is the, you know, the most unusual of years, um, a president that has a communicable disease. So as we all know today, the, uh, there was a lot of back and forth, but it looks like next week's debate's not gonna happen. And I'll be, and I, I agree with Aaron, um, the, the town hall debate where questions come from voters is, is really is an interesting debate because it, it just changes the dynamic. We don't yet know whether this, the next debate will be the town hall debate or the, which was supposed to be in Miami this coming week, or it'll be the debate that's gonna, that was supposed to be in Nashville um, on the 22nd. We don't really know what the format will be um, yet, but um, this is, I think this, uh, you know, it, the first debate, the first presidential debate was, was not very satisfying. Um, nobody likes to hear a conversation where you can't, um, where, where you can't finish a sentence. Um, and uh, it just, you didn't, I don't think anybody felt like they learned, learned very much. I think most presidential debates actually um, are much more successful events uh, than, than we saw in that first presidential debate. So I'm not sure that you throw the baby out with the bathwater. Um, I think it may be circumstantial. I think it may be related to the times and related to the, to the candidates. Um, but, you know, it's hard. It's hard. The reporters, when they ask a question, they hope that the candidates will answer. Um, and then it's up to the, the moderator to, um, I think, uh, if a candidate is not answering the question, I think it's a completely appropriate thing for the moderator to stop the candidate and say, excuse me, candidate, um, please answer the question that I asked, not the one that you had hoped I would ask. So this is the question. And when you repeat the question a few times and it's obvious that the candidate's not answering, I think that reflects poorly um, on the candidate. Uh, so I don't know that that requires a change in structure. It just is uh, um, every debate is different. And, and that's the best that a moderator can do is, is point out that the candidate is not answering their question in any way, shape or fashion. And I think at home, the viewers actually want the candidates to answer the question that was asked. And I think the viewers are smart enough to realize when a candidate has gone off and, to, and, and, and is completely ignoring the question, um, I think it reflects poorly on the candidate because it clearly shows that they either don't have a satisfactory answer or don't want to answer. And, and there's likely a story behind the story there. Yeah, I All was right. going to- uh, Yeah, go ahead, Ken. You know, one thing that- Interesting. You know, there, there's been discussions about should we have moot, you know, moot buttons or you know some some artificial way. And I was talking to an organizer of of the uh, past debates. Um, he he used to serve on the commission, and he was telling me that traditionally there was this this uh, you know requirement or, or you know push to have the moderator simply give the the each candidate two minutes or thirty seconds to rebuttal for a rebuttal. And, I, you know, the sense I get is that there's there's a need to just empower the moderator. You know, we've seen, you know, since 16, um, the, the moderator will often put out the topics for the debate and, and give the, the candidates sort of a broad sense of where each debate will be going, you know, how, how much time will be devoted to a certain segment. But I, I, you know, as Sam was saying, I think just you need the moderator to have the ability to just step in and, and, and run a debate as he or she sees fit and not be so confined to rules. So, you know, maybe we will see that more if, if we do actually have another debate. Um, you know, it does look like the Miami one is, is not gonna happen, but, you know, maybe there's still hope for one in Nashville. All right, thanks for the question, Gabe. Let's next go to Tom. I'm Tom Delaney, I'm a member of the class of 79. Uh, and this has been a great program. Thank you all for uh, making yourselves available. Um, while the changes that have occurred in terms of the conduct of the campaigns and the way they are covered uh, could not have been, were not planned or could not have been expected, is the voting public better off as a result? Um, is it bad that the campaigns have been forced to utilize the internet and other means to reach out to, to voters in a more virtual way? Um, were the, were the virtual conventions a better way of conveying party content than traditional conventions? Um, is there more space now for uh, uh, real issues to be covered when campaigns can't fall back on, on sort of empty calorie kind of events like rallies and that type, type of thing, which tends to absorb a lot of media time but doesn't really do much to advance what we're hearing as, as part of the electorate? Empty calories is my favorite uh, thing of, of the night. Uh, by the way. <laughs> so thank you for that. Listen, you know, I think I think the fact that that voters were a captive audience for most of this year 
uh, I think that that has really been um, the variable of this this election that has really made folks, I, well, I think that people were already energized and galvanized around this election, uh, but there were people who were paying attention a lot earlier, uh, I felt like, uh, than, um, than in previous cycles that I've covered. You know, normally, you know, Labor Day is when folks really start to kind of uh, focus in, but I mean, you think about this election cycle, you know, Joe Biden becoming the Democratic nominee weeks ahead of schedule. And so you had this deep stakes process that people were so laser focused in on. And then you had, you know, so many hurricanes, you had wildfires, people are seeing this on their television, you're seeing these protests, if they're not happening outside your door, you're seeing them, you know, being covered on cable news from morning until night. That is something, you know, as your child is is in the background with a tablet trying to trying to learn. So, you know, all of the, the intersection of everything is literally in people's living rooms every single day. And, you know, we finally pivot back uh, to, to, to a very consequential election uh, in, in which, you know, people are seeing, uh, you know, Congress not coming up with a, a plan to, to address uh, coronavirus relief. That's affecting people, you know, on a very real level. Um, so I, I think the combination of, of people being at home and also, um, you know, the campaigns trying to figure out how to still get their attention um, with all of these competing issues is, is, has been such an interesting dynamic. And, and I'm so interested to see kind of how it plays out um, in the time that, that we have left between now and, and uh, when we find out who the next president is. Yeah, and I think I guess we'll see come the election how it's really been for the campaigns. I mean, you have the Trump campaign that has still been on the ground, knocking on doors, doing the traditional route, still doing some virtual things, but really has has kept up that in-person presence. Whereas Biden campaign is just now starting to go back into in-person campaigning, but for months they were relying on these virtual events. And from what I was hearing, you know, from my, you know, sources back in New Hampshire and other voters is, you know, in, in some ways, you know, were campaigns always going to be able to reach super rural voters, for example, just just by way of manpower and, and geography? Perhaps not. But now that everyone is plugged in and they're living their lives online, like, you know, when everyone is stuck at home, I had so many Zoom happy hours for a while. Um, and it, it really is the campaigns meeting the, the voters where they are. And then as a reporter, we're really doing that as well. I mean, I feel like just working at a company like NBC, everything has had to get streamlined and integrated way more so than usual from, from network to cable to streaming to digital because everything is online right now because people are living these virtual lives. And I think that, you know, for a big critique of both media and politics is like, oh, it's been done the same way forever. And now that, you know, as, as many of us have said today, we've had to get really creative. I think that's making people curious just to see what is going to happen. Hey, Tom, it's good. Uh, we played a lot of basketball uh, back in the day. Um, <laughs> I was going to say, I, I think virtual events are here to stay. I, I really do. I think when things get back to normal, you know, we will obviously see rallies. We will obviously see, you know, the traditional campaign events that you're used to. But I think campaigns have learned that there's a lot of efficiency in uh, virtual events. They can, they can reach a lot of people. In, without spending a lot of time. And, and certainly on the fundraising end, I, I think the campaigns, it's been a real revelation for the Biden campaign, how much they can raise money online. And, and, and you know, they can do three virtual fundraisers in a day and, in, 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 you know, from, from the candidates home. So, I, you know, I think um, th we will see a lot of these, um, these, these innovations from the pandemic, I think we'll see them in future campaigns and they'll be part of, you know, the, the repertoire that, that campaigns use. Okay, Tom, thank you for the question. Uh, I wish we could take more of the uh, excellent questions that have come in. Uh, Lord knows this topic, there's a lot more content that we barely scratched the surface of. So make sure that you all come back. Uh, Julia, Ken, Sam, Aaron, thanks so much for joining us for this conversation tonight um, and for all that you do to continue to support Georgetown and our programming. I wanna thank uh, again, Rich uh, and the folks at the Georgetown Entertainment Media Alliance again.
uh, for being such great partners in this event. You can follow and learn more about the cool things that GEMA is doing. Follow them on social media at GEMA Hoyas. Um, you can also, I hope you'll also continue to follow what we're doing at the Institute of Politics and Public Service. Um, follow us at GU Politics. We do lots of different events on lots of different topics. Our next one is tomorrow at one o'clock in the afternoon, um, where we'll be hosting a conversation with former Bush administration, Homeland Security uh, Secretary Michael Chertoff and former Obama administration, Homeland Security Secretary Jay Johnson for a conversation on um, uh, combating foreign interference in our elections. So that is another very timely conversation as we enter the final weeks of the election. Most importantly, I wanna thank all of you, all the students, all uh, uh, who joined us here in the Zoom, everyone else who tuned in on social media, thank you for sharing part of your evening with us um, and uh, make sure to vote. Thanks everybody. <laughs>